My guest is Julie Poole, spiritual and personal empowerment coach, psychic channeler, energy healer, hypnotherapist, law of attraction teacher, and author of six books. Julie, thank you for joining me today and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here, Jeff. Well, we are honored to have you. And Julie, part of your spiritual journey includes a near-death-like experience. So can we start with that and go from there? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I was a very spiritual child. I was a very um, connected child. And I would say, and I do say to people, all children, all of us, we're born intuitively psychic. We can feel and see and sense. We have all of that. And then gradually, for most children, it begins to close down, generally around the time they start school, three, four or five. And for others, it doesn't really close down. Mine, I would say, kind of went about halfway down. It was still there somewhat. I had a vivid imagination and I would play with the energies that I could see. Uh, I could see energies around trees and flowers and plants, and um, I could certainly feel energy at home in my parents' relationship, which was deteriorating fast by the time I was about six or seven. Um, and then they split up, and it was all very explosive and dad was then gone he visited he was still in my life but he wasn't living at home anymore he was living a long way away um mum wasn't coping at all when these things happen um we've got two choices as parents we kind of step up to say okay i've got to be mum and dad um or in my mother's case completely fell apart at the seams and was neither so i was a quite well, very neglected child, lonely child. Um, and um, there was a lot of violence and screaming and shouting and alcoholic drunkenness and all sorts of unpleasantness. So um, I went through quite a difficult period uh, between seven, eight, nine, around that time. And I was um, hugely taken advantage of by a very sick individual who lived a few doors away. And um, I don't really need to go into detail. I do talk about it, but it's not really appropriate to go into that much detail here. But it culminated in um, an extremely traumatic event for me, um, which was in a woodland. And um, there was pretty bad things happening to me during that traumatic event. Suffice to say that it was so traumatic that one minute I was experiencing this trauma, not understanding really much of what was happening. And the next thing, I was sitting high up in the trees on a branch, completely in peace and looking around. And there was this wonderful gentleman sat next to me on this branch of this tree with his arm around me saying to me, look at the birds and look at the flowers and look at the trees, feel the energy of the breeze. Never mind what's going on down there. You talk to me. And he was just lovely. I didn't really question why I was up 100 feet up in the trees. <laughs> That's what it felt like when you're little. Obviously, it wasn't, but it was a way up. And I clearly was out of my body. And we chatted for some time. I don't know how long, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. But all of the time we were chatting, he was just so kind. He was so lovely. He, he was just so sweet. And then eventually he said to me, it's time for you to go back down. And it'll hurt when you go back down, but it won't hurt for long. You'll get better and it'll be all right. And whenever you need me, you just call on me and I'll be there. I am your friend. And I said, that's lovely. Thank you very much. And what's your name? And he said, my name is Jesus. And I said, oh, I've heard of you. They talk about you at school and things. I'd never been in church particularly, but um, I knew his name and he was now my new best friend. And the next thing I knew, I was back in my body and he was right. It wasn't pleasant. Um, but from that point forward, I became so completely aware of energy and vibration and my friend Jesus and he would come visit me and we would sit on my bed at night and we would talk we would talk about God and love and the Bible 
Bible and all sorts of things. And I started going to church. I was about eight and a half, nine, started going to church so that I could talk to my friend Jesus. But I was always disagreeing with the the, the vicar, the preacher, um, about their interpretations. And I'd be sitting there in the in the church and my mate Jesus would be sat next to me and I'd be saying, is that right? And he'd be going, no, no, that's not the way it is at all. And then I'd go downstairs to Sunday school and um, and I would be saying, my friend Jesus says that God didn't say that and God wouldn't do that, that God loves us and God would never judge us like that. I was a precocious little brat, but I was absolutely convinced I wasn't going to believe them and what they said. I was going to believe my mate Jesus. Well, that went on for about 10 years. Um, and I went to lots of different churches. I was on a mission to find somebody that was talking what he was talking about. And um, I went through the high church, the ordinary church, the Baptist, the Methodist. I went through every church until eventually at about 17, I found my way to the spiritualist church. And these these lot made more sense than anybody else. They talked about karma. They talked about past lives, which I knew all about because we discussed them a lot. Um, and I had at that age um, a, quite a lot of knowledge um, about how the world and the universe really works and what love is and what God is and who we are and that we are God personified and we all have help and angels and support and love and I was learning so much. Um, so that continued and has continued all through my life. But alongside this spiritual development and understanding, and we're talking back in the 70s here, and it wasn't as talked about and open as it is now. You know, I was very weird. I was very wacky. I was very strange. Um, that I had healing abilities. I understood that my body was a healing machine and I just needed to activate the healing energy within me. And Jesus showed me how, and I would be able to take away headaches. I'd be able to take away stomach aches and my monthly cycle, I could take that away. And I would help other people to do this. My friends, I would say, you know, I can, I can make that go away for you. So there was a lot of that going on, but underneath that at the same time, there was a very traumatized child who was struggling to understand the things that had happened to her when she was little. And they continued to um, happen periodically and the trauma built and built. And it's one of the things that happens when we've had very challenging childhoods like I had, um, that we tend to perpetuate the cycle because of low self-worth and shame and all sorts of other stuff. So I ended up going into, I was kicked out of home just as the day I left school. My mother said, there's your bags, go, don't want you here anymore. Um, I slept rough for a couple of days. Then some friends took me in and I was sofa surfing for a while. I mean, it wasn't a nice and easy life in any way. And I think this is why I was so attached to the spiritual side because in this is where I could find peace I could find a sense of love a sense of safety and life I didn't like at all it was hard it was cruel and I didn't like it but I ended up leaving home and um, moving in with a boy that I met pretty quickly afterwards I was 16 he was 17 he was just as damaged as I was it was a disaster waiting to happen um, and we were together for um, three to four years and about three and a half, something like that. And it was a disaster of two very damaged people coming together. And during that time, I was talking to my spirit guides a lot about, you know, how how has this happened? How have I ended up in this situation again with more of the same? Lots of violence, lots of bad stuff happening. Um and, and absolutely having no clue how to get out of it. And I would talk to my guides and uh, I would talk to Jesus and it moved on. And eventually I left this relationship. And that's when the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, began to kick in. When I finally, at 21, got into a place on my own with my two and a half year old child um, and I started to rebuild and I started to feel safe 
then all of these huge emotions started coming up and out of nowhere. And they were overwhelming. Uh, and I just couldn't understand them. I couldn't process them at 21. You're just too, too young. Um, and you know, front, frontal cortex hasn't even developed at 21. You know, you just you just know you feel bad. And I woke up every day with anxiety, panic attacks, flashbacks, nightmares, wake up screaming. It was horrible, horrible time. Um, and it got to the point where I just couldn't cope. I couldn't cope anymore at all. I just did not want to be in life anymore. I couldn't bear the pain emotionally that I was in. It's very difficult to explain to anybody who's never experienced that level of despair how challenging just waking up every day can be when you wake up every day with that pain. And I couldn't cope. And because I had such a strong awareness spiritually of the love and the light and that we're from the other side and this is just life, this home is up there, I just wanted to go home. And I would talk to my guides and say, you know, I don't want to be here anymore. And they'd say, you know, just hang on in there. It'll get better. And it went on for about six months and I got worse and worse and worse and ended up on lots of pills. The doctor that I saw diagnosed me with depression and anxiety and gave me tranquilizers and sleeping pills and various things. It made me worse. I just went down further and further and further until in the end, I just made the decision. This is too hard. I don't want to be here. Now, I do not advocate this. Absolutely do not. Um, but I ended up saying, absolutely, I want to check out. I don't want to be here anymore. And I took a massive overdose. Um, it wasn't a cry for help. It was absolutely determined. My son was with his father for the weekend. Um, and yeah, I was done. I I didn't feel I could be a good mum. I couldn't offer anything anyway. I couldn't look after myself, never mind a child. I was a wreck. So I took a huge overdose. I took everything I had. I took all the Valium, all the sleeping pills, all the paracetamol, everything in the house. I took the whole lot, got into bed, and a huge relief that, like, I'm done. I'm never going to have to wake up again, and I'm never going to have to feel that level of shame and disgust and fear that I have felt every day for 15 years. I don't have to do it anymore. I'm done. So I went to sleep. So the next thing I know was I felt a, a lot of what I thought at the time were people around me. And then I felt myself lift, lift up. And I realized they weren't people. They were spirit. They were angels. They were my spirit guides and my angels. And they came and they literally, I felt myself lift up out of my body and I felt myself traveling up. And I thought, this is higher than the tree that I was in with Jesus when I left my body last time. This is definitely going to a different place. I went up and up and up. And then the next thing I know, I'm in what I now recognize and I've, I've been in several times since as the angelic realms and the angelic temple. And they took me into the temple and they laid me down. Jesus was there. My angels were there and they were healing me. And at that point, I was very aware of what they were doing. And I started arguing with them and saying, no, 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 no. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, you're going back. <laughs> no, no, no. There was an argument that went on for some time. I, I'm home. I'm I'm home. And they said, no, it's not your time. Um, so they said, you know, we're going to have to work very hard to sort this out with you, but we are going to make you go back. They told me right from the beginning I wasn't staying. This was a, a temporary situation. And then they spent some time explaining to me um, what was going on. So I was in this period lying down. I was laying flat. They were around me. I was talking to them and I was telling them to stop putting the healing into me. And they were saying, no, just you need to understand this is not your time and this was your path, and all of this was meant to be. And then they started explaining to me this life that I had chosen, including those experiences. This was a, this was new to me. I did not know about this. So I was at the time in a very victim-oriented mindset, understandably so. But I was, woe is me, life has been horrible to me, and I suffered horrible, horrible things. Um, and it's not fair, and all of those things, which are absolutely justified. 
But um, they said, you know, you chose this. And I was like, get out of here. No way would I choose this. So they were explaining to me then about karma, about past lives, about um, family um, inheritances, ancestral en energy that, that has gone through my, my family line and how I had chosen to take this on and clear it for myself, my ancestors, and to clear a lot of it in the collective. So they spend a long time explaining all of this to me, including the fact that I'd chosen my parents who would neglect and abandon and let me get on with it and not be supportive. Because one of my lessons, life choices that my soul had made was, I want to do it on my own. I want to um, be able to thrive without a huge network around me. And then they showed me many past lives where I'd had, one was I was a, a monk within a monastery and there was loads of people. Another one, I was a nun within a convent. Another, I was within a very large and very loving family with loads and loads of support. And they said, do you see, you've had it. You've had all that support. There's no point keep repeating the same lesson. This time you said, like, let's try and do it without the support. Let's see how I can grow in resilience and independence and a myriad of other things. But the main purpose was for you to grow in forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the highest forms of love. And so the soul is always here to expand and grow in love. And there are many ways that we can do that. And they were explaining to me that there are different levels of growth, just a little bit like school. What we learn when we're in infant school, kindergarten, is the basic two plus two is four. But by the time we get up to high school, we're learning calculus and you know algebra and stuff. By the time if we went on to university, we're, we're really learning the very hard stuff. And they said, for you, you've had so many lifetimes. This is university level stuff. This is not easy stuff. So for you to expand in forgiveness, you needed something huge to expand, to grow, to forgive. All right. And so you chose these experiences, you know, that are huge. How, how can you forgive what has happened to you? How can you forgive your parents for neglecting you to the point where these things would happen to you? You have so many opportunities here for forgiveness and growth and to grow in love. And this is what you chose. And we did warn you that it would be tough, that it would be hard. And we did say, you know, why don't you do it gently over, say, three or four lifetimes? And you said, no, no. You, they said you were a nightmare. You were so stubborn. You know best. You want to do it in one. You want to learn all this stuff and you're going to do it in one. And we did say we'll have to put an awful lot of support from us in place in order to get you through this. So I understood all of that. And they said to me at the time, you are not meant to go now at 21. You will be here until you're 67. Now, when you're 21, that feels like a very, very long way away. I tell you what, nearly 61, it doesn't feel very far off at all. However, that's a different story because that timeline has changed now. And we'll come on to that in a minute. But at the time, I agreed, all right, I'll come back. And I will learn to forgive my parents because right now I hate them. And I will learn to forgive the bad people that have hurt me. And it'll take time, but the most important person I need to forgive right now is me. Because like every abused person, you blame yourself. And so I had to start with that forgiveness with me. I shouldn't have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I shouldn't have gone to that event, and I shouldn't have worn that. You know, we all do this. So the, the healing began with me. So anyway, I agreed to come back. And I don't remember the back journey. I remember the going up journey. I don't remember the coming back. Uh, journey but I remember waking up and um, I was in my bed and my head hurt and I felt stoned out of my brains and um, I'd never done drugs but I thought if this is what drugs is it, I don't like it but I was clearly still alive and still here and I was woken from a banging on the door and I got up um, in my pajamas and I answered the door and it was a friend of mine and she said where the hell have you been we've been looking for you for three days uh, I'm like, well, what day is it? And it was three days later. 
and nobody had seen me and they'd started to worry and they'd come round and bang in on the door. Um, where have you been? I'm in bed <laughs> for three days, you know. So, um, yeah, I, she could see that I wasn't quite myself, asked, saw the empty bottles of pills by the bed and immediately grabbed me, got me dressed and took me to the doctors and said, she's been stupid, she's taken an overdose, sort her out. And they said to me, when did you take this? And I said, I think it was Sunday evening. And it, this was Wednesday. And he said, what did you take? And I said, well, I don't know, all the all the stuff you gave me. And he said, no, you didn't. Because if you did, you would not be sat in that chair. You would be dead. And I thought, well, the bottles are all empty. And I haven't got a dog or a cat, so where else have they gone, you know? But I knew the doctor wasn't going to believe me. I just smiled and um, I wasn't upset that I was still alive. I, I understood what the angels, you know, had said. Um, and I'm like, OK, I've got to make I've somehow got to make this life work. I don't know how, but I've got to make it work. So um, he um, referred me to a psychiatrist. So I, I didn't tell him about the, you know, I went up to the angelic realms for three days because they'd lock me up. Um, but I did tell him about the uh, attempted suicide. So he referred me to a psychiatrist who I saw once. And um, it was enough. It was that one session with, uh, he wanted to carry on seeing me, but I didn't want to go. But it was enough for him to say, no wonder you feel the way you feel. You have got, they didn't use the words PTSD in those days. Um, he said to me and, and that, that I don't think that came until the 90s. And this would have been about 83 or something. Um he said that I was suffering from um, some form of, of uh, an overload of trauma and um, that it was now releasing now that I was out of the trauma. And so then once I understood, oh, OK, that's why I feel crazy, because to me, it didn't make any sense. I was always coping when I was in the, the chaos and the crisis. But as soon as I was safe, I wasn't coping. And that didn't make sense to me. So when he explained it, that it was all now trying to work its way out now that I'm safe and the crisis is over, it made sense and I'm OK. And I didn't go back. But what I did do was continue to um, work with my guides and um, healing and accepting that I am here for life and stop feeling like a victim and start working on your own healing. So I uh, worked with counsellors and I gently over the next 15 years just coped with life. I got married again to a lovely man, had another child, I got, created a career. And all the way through that, I was still extremely spiritual, talking to my guides, talking to my angels, meditating every day. Um, and then when I was about 37, so yeah, 15, 16 years later, my guides came to me one day and said, um, it's time now for you to step into the world that you were brought here to, to be, which is to be a spiritual teacher. And I looked at them and kind of went, what? <laughs> what? You know, I've spent 16 years building a career in um, social housing, which is working with vulnerable people who needed a home because having been homeless several times, you know. And I worked with women's refuges, domestic violence, mental health projects, you know, and I'd been to college on day release for four years and I had this career and they kind of said, yes, but it's not for you and you're very tired and stressed and worn out and it's time for it to stop. So I just, okay. So I, I, I quit. I wrote about this in my book. They were saying it's time to let go and let your spiritual gifts and awareness come forward and use it to help others. So I quit the job, sold my house, um, moved 200 miles um, to Cornwall in England, which is a beautifully spiritual place, wonderful light and energy, beautiful people. And I retrained as a hypnotherapist and um, set up as a healing hypnotherapy, intuitive uh, readings, things like that, and teaching, started teaching spiritual classes. Um, because then it was 2000 and other people were starting to wake up, uh, starting to awaken. An angel shop sprang up on the corner of the, the street and we wouldn't have had that 10 years before. And I was in there buying all sorts of things. But I continued to work with my guides and people were coming to me because I'd 
had awareness of this since I was seven or eight years old. And so by the time I was coming 40, they saw me as somewhat of the expert. I don't consider myself an expert. I know a lot, but I'm, you know, we're all a work in progress. We're always learning. But I knew more than the average person, if you like. So I started helping and showing them. And um, I did that for the next, well, I'm still doing it. You know, here we are now. Um, but during that time, um, I ended up with having a lot of clients come to me for hypnotherapy and healing who had been through similarly traumatic events. And I was working with them and helping them to heal. And I healed myself as well, using a variety of methods that um, my spiritual team were giving me. They'd guide me to certain books. Uh, it wasn't all coming through from the eight ethers it would be read this and watch this and listen to that because the answers are there but no no one place had all the answers it was like a jigsaw you're fitting bits of a jigsaw together so um i've i found a book called um the journey by brendan bays where she talked about healing herself of cancer through working with her emotions and traumas within her body and I'm like, oh, click, a little click there. Um, and then I found some other stuff, the emotion code, uh, Brad, Dr. Bradley Nelson, and reading those. And I started applying it to me. And then one day I went into a massive healing spurge into my body, understanding that physical areas within my body were holding trauma and that I needed to release those now. So I I did a big exercise. I felt I called in um, the team I was working with at the time, which was White Eagle and the Rainbow Warriors. And I brought those in and then I just allowed the energy within me to purge. And it was intense. Um, and then a few days after that, I felt a huge shift in my body. So being a little bit more specific without being graphic, at that point, I had had gynecological problems all my life. No surprise there why. Um, and I was actually due for a hysterectomy and the whole lot was coming out. And a week before the operation, my guys were saying to me, we can heal this, we can heal this. And I said, show me how. So I'd read all these books. It'd been building up for about a year. And then we did this big healing exercise and I felt and visualized this enormous black energy coming out of me and leaving me. And then this calm, this incredible calm came over me. And three days later, I had my monthly cycle and I would normally go white and I would have to go to bed for three days. That was my normal thing. I didn't even know that my monthly cycle had started. I, I had no pain at all. I didn't even need to take a parasite. Settable. There was, and normally I had these huge pills from the hospital, which were like horse pills. They were so strong, painkillers. I didn't even know. And I was like, oh my God, I'm fixed. This is amazing. Um, and uh, I was, I went to see my local doctor, my local GP, uh, general practitioner. And I thought he's going to think I'm completely mental. How do I explain this to him? You know? And I said, I waited two years because I live in the UK and we don't have insurance. We've got the National Health Service and you can get it all free, but you've got to wait. And I'd waited two years and you wait for your name to come to the top of the list. And my my name was the, on the top of the list and my operation was next week. And I thought the doctor is going to poo poo me out of the office. But I thought all I can do is tell my truth. And I said to him, I've had a realization. I truly believe that my gynecological problems were related to some previous traumas. And I have worked with them and through them. And I just had a normal cycle. I don't think I need the operation. And I waited for him to laugh me out of the office or get the white van to lock me up. But he actually smiled and said, I hold a lot of store in what you're saying, and I'll tell you why. It's because I have got many patients who've had the hysterectomy and they're still having problems, and there's nothing there. There's nothing left. They've had it taken out, but they're still having problems. So he said, if you feel that this is psychological or psychosomatic or whatever words you want to use, I'll go with it. 
So he said, what we can do with the operation, he said, is I will write to them now and tell them to put you on a hold, right? So you're top of the list on hold for six months and we'll see how you go over the next six months. And if it hasn't worked and you need the op, then we can just reenact it and we'll have it. And so, okay. So I was like, bless, the, the doctor's given me some grace here. And for the next six months, I had six normal cycles and the operation was cancelled and I'm still fully intact. And I also worked for the next year with um, a counsellor who specialised in that type of abuse and I learned a lot. And I finally in that time stepped into forgiveness and I was able, I'd already forgiven me and over the previous decade, I'd forgiven my parents. And finally, I could forgive the bad men who, who'd hurt me. And there was such a release and liberation in it. Anyway, coming back to the, the shift in my longevity, um, about, uh, let me think, when did I write that book? Uh, 2015, 2016, something like that. I was guided to put all this knowledge of everything that I'd experienced and how I'd healed myself and then how I'd use this knowledge for the next 15 years to help other people heal. I put it all in a book. And when I was um, writing this book, and this was a factual book, not a spiritual book, this is, you know, very detailed, I was looking at a lot of scientific studies. And I found this one study called the ACE study adverse childhood effects. It was a long-term study over 20 odd years and it looked at things, adverse effects in childhood. And there was a scoring system. And if you scored higher than five on this scale, your longevity was reduced by 20 years minimum. And it, this has been sort of evidence and it's to do with the amounts of difficulties we have in those formative first 10 years of life really. And my ACE score was eight out of 10. So I was very, very high. So when I was reading the study, so I could interpret it and put some of this information into my book and uh, reference it and everything, I stopped uh, sort of midway through writing this book and had a chat with upstairs. And I said, hey, we need to talk. So I've done my healing and I've done my forgiveness and I've released this stuff off my body. So the 67 years that you gave me when I was 21, that would have been made sense then if they're saying that you you know your longevity is reduced by 20 to 25 years so it would be around my 60s rather than my 80s and they said that's correct and that's why your time was 67 but because of the healing that you've done your lifespan has now been extended back to normal so we will see you and they started to tell me 2040 something and then they're like you don't need to know anymore but you've got lots of time left and so um i've had it a couple of times where i'm going to be here until somewhere in the 2040s which gives me another 20 odd years and i'm just coming 61 so i'm expecting now to live into my 80s potentially late 80s um and i'm really good with that and it's interesting because this whole time from 21 up until about 50 was it's kind of I've got until I'm 67 to try and figure this out and put this right and find a way to live life the best way I can live it and that was the way I did and I worked it and it was okay but something shifted um around but after I wrote that that book uh, moving past the past um something shifted where I wasn't just coping with life living the best life I could I actually started falling in love with life. I started really enjoying life. I started to find a new joy that I'd never had before. I'd, I'd been happy and I've been, I've liked life. We've had a kind of, what's the word? It's kind of, we, 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 got, we came to a place of peace, me and life. We're, no, we're not fighting anymore and I'm not trying to leave and it's not trying to hold me. We, we kind of called a truce, if you like, me and life. And then something shifted about eight years ago when I said, you know what, I've really not appreciated you, life. I have not seen the beauty in this life. I was too filled with pain to see the beauty, but I see it now. And thank you for having me. And I will stay for as long as you want me. And there is a massive shift there. And it's... So, you know, sort of going from the first 21 years, I didn't want to be here at all, to from 21 to about 55 was, yeah, this is okay. I'm all right with this, to 
I friggin' love this. And that is the difference. And it's been magnificent. I'm so grateful and blessed. Um, so I don't do any of that work anymore. I, I did it up until 2020. Um, I did it for nearly 20 years. I helped an awful lot of very traumatized people. Then one day um, I stopped really enjoying it. Um, and I spoke to my team about it. I said, that that session was really hard. And they said, you've had harder. And I said, I know. So why does it feel so hard? And they said, I think you're done now. You've done enough. You've done it. Let somebody else take the baton, right? You've put all of this information in a book. You've helped loads of people. Let, let somebody else take it on now. You go work now with higher vibrational people who are already in a really good place and want to get to a better place. And I'm like, okay. So my work shifted um, and it shifted during 2020 and then it's moved again um, and it shifted again more recently where I've um, really moving away from doing one-to-one -one clients and one-to-one -one sessions. That's winding down now over the next two months. Um, and then it's right opening up to more teaching, which is what I love to do. And then there's another book that I want to write. Um, but when I wrote um, my uh, my book in 2022, From Hoping to Having, um, that is trying to show people how to get that thing in life that I found. How do you love life? How can you really make yourself not just tolerate life, but really enjoy it? and really make the best life you can. And so um, I wrote that book and um, it's helped so many people already. I'm so delighted to be able to reach so many people. Um, and uh, yeah, yesterday I, I couldn't believe it when I woke up and I saw it number one on Amazon Kindle, um, Amazon US, Amazon.com. Um, I was like, oh, thank you. That's amazing. Um, but this being received well, it's helping people. I want to be able to show people how the law of attraction works, how life can work and how we can find joy, even in the darkness, even in the most challenging, difficult, desperate times. And I think it's one of the, the things that people like about me on my YouTube channel is that there is this sense, they say, of non-judgment. It's like, who the hell am I to judge? You know, look at what I've done and what I've been through. I I don't judge anybody. Um, it's it, each, each of us, we're walking our own path. We're walking the best that we can with the tools that we've got. And if somebody can help us along and give us a little pointer, a little direction, then that's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's what it's about. Julie, thank you for sharing your life with us. I don't know if you know this, but bodies are supposed to last till about 120 years of age. So I think you really have another 60 years left than <laughs> just 20. And I hope you make it that long. I think it might be about 30. We'll see. We'll see. But of course, the toll does get taken on the body. The body starts to get a bit tired and worn down. But um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the next third of my life. Do you think that you finished all your lessons here on earth and you don't oh, need, God, no. <laughs> you don't need to reincarnate anymore? Oh, in that in that sense, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we all of us are learning every day, right? To the day we die, we're learning, we're growing. Um, they tell me it's a choice whether I come back again. But this is supposed to be if I do it right. So we'll, you know, we won't know for a while. But if I do it right, this is supposed to be my last life here. And this is something that really has resonated with me in the last five or six years. It's like, this is your last go. You're never going to taste that food again. You're never going to experience these things again because they're not on other planets. I might have lifetimes in other planets, in other universes. Uh, I might be somebody's guide um, to, you know, be overseeing them. But this is my last lifetime on planet earth so let's enjoy it let's make the most of it um if i don't complete all the lessons all the experiences um then i i'll have to come back again um we can undo good you know i've done a lot of good and i've helped a lot of people but i've made a lot of mistakes too and i don't know whether it'll all be balanced up the other side um from this perspective, which is so narrow, um, I think I think I, I've done okay. 
but from a higher, wiser perspective, when I get to the other side and see all the, the people I've harmed, and I have harmed people, from not understanding my actions on them when I was in my trauma or my triggers or my reactions, um, and whether I have righted those wrongs and balanced that karma, I don't know. I'll find out when I get the other side. And if I've got to come back and do it again, I'm okay with that. I'm good. I'm good with that. Um, but apparently, uh, they tell me that I've got a lot more work to do here. There isn't an early retirement for me. Um, I've only really started enjoying life in the last five or six years. You know, life was okay, good. Life was good. I wouldn't say it was awful. Life was good. Um, but it's only got really good in the last five or six years. What well, Just because this change in attitude, it's like, I want to be here. You know, life isn't happening to me. It's happening for me. This is the law of attraction in action. And I knew about the law of attraction since 2006 when I read The Secret, but I wasn't applying it. I was applying bits of it, but I was missing bits of it. And like a jigsaw without all the pieces, the picture is still jumbled. It's not clear. And so in once I made a decision, I like life. I'm like, I need to work this out. I need to work out how this works. Because when I talk to my spiritual team, they say to me, life should be incredibly joyful and joyous and abundant and exciting and adventurous. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm missing quite a few of those. So you know, I'm enjoying life, but I'm missing quite, there isn't abundance. Um, certainly there was, I was not in poverty like I have been, you know, there were times in my life where I have literally had malnutrition, where I was starved. And, um, you know, I have not had that, but I haven't had any kind of abundance. So there was always enough but no extra. There was no luxuries. There was no exciting ad adventures because exciting adventures cost money, you know, and I didn't have money. So I started saying, right, okay, how do, how do I have the exciting adventures? And they're like, right, you need to align with abundance. Right, how do I do that? Go back to the secret, but then go and watch all these other amazing teachers and realize that each of them are saying the right thing, but they're saying it in different ways. So you might learn a bit from there and a bit from there and a bit from there and pull it together until the jigsaw is complete and it all fits and clicks. So that's what I started to do around 2016, 17, 2017. I started really, really focusing on the law of attraction and um, I pulled the pieces of the jigsaw together and bit by bit, various aspects of my life started to improve. So money started to come in for the first time. And that meant a holiday. I haven't had a holiday in 20 years. Oh, right. OK. That meant a little exciting adventure. All right. So now we're starting that curiosity. Um, then my business started to elevate and then my um, confidence started to elevate and all these different areas started to come up. Um, and then I started setting goals. I started applying what I was learning and taking inspired action on it. And the the transformation in my life over the next three or four years was staggering. I literally went from I was I had no savings account because there was no savings to put in a savings account. Um, I had a very old and battered car, old and battered furniture, rented house. Um, at the in September 2018, I was 17 grand in debt. Um, I sold my car, my furniture. Um, I literally had a bed and a telly. That was about it. I literally went back to nothing. And that's where I was September 2018, where I am today in six years. I'm currently about to buy a house that is the dream house. I have a really lovely car that is bought and paid for in cash. I have a successful business. Um, I have... £150,000 cash sitting in my bank ready to go into my new house. And that's surplus extra on what I use month by month to live. I set a goal that I wanted to travel and somebody else to pay for it. I want to go and speak and teach and inspire and motivate. And, you know, I can be the new Tony Robbins. I can do that, you know, and I just set these goals. And within six months, I was invited to go to Canada to give a, a workshop, to lead a workshop, an international workshop, which I'm like, oh, my God. And they paid for me to go and they paid for everything. And I got to go to Canada. Um, and then I was invited to America. 
And it's like, oh, I never been to america i'd never been out of europe so these things are starting to come together um my house i'm i'm buying it's expected to complete in september and it's a dream absolute dream house and it will be my forever home and am i where i want to be no i've got goals you know i set a goal when i started youtube to get to a hundred thousand subscribers i had 167 at the time and i said i'm going to get a hundred thousand subscribers I currently have 186,000. My viewing figures last month were 820,000, three, over three quarters of a million. And I, I set the goals, I do the work, I take the action and it comes. So I've been teaching people about this. And so when um, a couple of years ago, my spiritual team, who I call Eli, said, right, write it all in a book. We want people to get out of this. Life is so hard. Life is so horrible. Nothing works for me. So I wrote the book, and that's the one that got to um, number one in Kindle yesterday. Only only overnight. It's number two today. I had another little look. I was like, yay. But it's helping people. It's brilliant. And when I read the, the feedback, it's like I'm already seeing transformations in my life. I mean, that's why I wrote it. This is brilliant. But I want to do more talks, and I, I want more adventures you know and i want to be able to help people along the way with those adventures you know it's a win-win it's beautiful life this life is beautiful it is if we let it many people since the secret has been out have tried to work with the law of attraction and failed yeah what are the pieces that they are missing what can you share there are with so us? many so many pieces people just we don't want to overcomplicate it, but it isn't just about create a vision board. This is the main take that people got from the secret was visualize, imagine it, be clear on what you want and have a vision board. And they've done that. Tick, tick, tick. Well done. Yeah. On my vision board, there's my dream house and there's this and there's this and nothing's happening and nothing is shifting. So visualizing is very important. But the law of attraction is more than visualizing. It's an energy. It's a magnetic energy. You don't get what you want. You get what you are. Now, the secret says this, but most people don't get it. You know, it's one of the things that the feedback with my book is they're saying, there's nothing new in my book. There's nothing that hasn't been said by other books, but they're saying it's the first time I actually get it. I actually understand it. It's a roadmap. It's exactly telling me step by step what to do. My book's in three sections, remember, reset, receive. And the remember is all about your power. Remember who you are. You are a divine being of light. You are a spark of consciousness. You are a creative being. You can create. You are always creating. But when you're creating from a place of disempowerment, you create more disempowerment. When you create from a place of lack, you create more lack. You create. You are the source of what you get. Be the source of what you want. So if I want success, it's no good me visualizing it while I'm in an energy of failure. You're just going to get more failure. You have to change your vibration. You have to change your thinking. You have to change your beliefs. So as a hypnotherapist of 20 odd years, a professional hypnotherapist, I know the way the belief system works, the subconscious. I'm an expert in that. I will absolutely hold my hand up and say, I am an expert in the subconscious. I know the way the beliefs work. So what we've got to do, the visualizing is fantastic. Now we step into that visualizing and say, do I truly believe that I deserve it? Do I truly believe this is good for me? Do I truly believe that I can have it? And the answer is usually no, no, and hell no. Right. Well, that's why it's not coming. So what my book is doing and my teachings and my YouTube channel is doing is trying to show you how to break that cycle. So if you want success somehow, and it's not easy, you know, I'm, I'm talking to somebody who's been street homeless and, and all sorts of that. It's difficult to get into the I'm abundant and I am this and I am that. Right. So how? If you want, let's find something that give me an example of what you might want to manifest that you haven't got. I want complete financial freedom. There you go. Lovely. So do I. That's something that lots of us can relate to and can want. Okay. So first of all, what does complete financial freedom look like to you? 
you'll have a figure in your mind. You'll have an amount of money. You'll have an idea of what that looks like. OK, so complete financial freedom to one person might be 20 grand and to another person, it's two million, five million, 10 million, 100 million. First of all, work out what is that figure? And do I align with that figure? Does it feel that it's possible? Because when I aligned with 100,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, when I have 167, it felt very out of reach. All right. And as long as it feels out of reach, I'm not going to align with it. So I have to find a way to get in alignment with it. Now, for me, 100,000 felt too big a jump. And if your financial freedom, complete financial freedom was, say, 10 million, um, that feels too big a jump from where I am now. All right. So can we visualize it as stepping stones up to that point? Can we shift a little bit towards, right? So when I had 167 subs and I wanted 100,000, I said, I'm going to align with 100. Oh, I had 167. I'm going to align with 1,000. And then I'm going to align with 10,000. And then I'm going to align with 50,000, right? Because getting from 10 to 50, I can visualize, I can align with, I think, yeah, I can make that happen. I believe in it. Then when I get to 50,000, I'm up to 100, right? So once I got to 100, I'd already, and I've already, I'm on, I'm 250 is my next one. And then I'm on a mission for 500, half a million. That's that's my goal. But if I said, can I get to 500,000 from 167, the answer would have been no, it's too big a jump. So can we put it in bites, small bite size to say, okay, so what does complete financial freedom mean? And for most people, and this is where they really shoot themselves in the foot, they'll say, I'm going to align with winning the lottery. Right. OK, so they put all their focus and all their spare money into buying lottery tickets. It's not the best way. It's not impossible, but it's highly unlikely. OK, so make yourself a goal. I've got a goal of complete financial freedom. I'm taking on a huge mortgage at 61 years of age, you know, and that's scary. So first of all, I acknowledge the fear. And then I say, OK, it's a 14 year mortgage because in the UK you can't get a mortgage past 75 unless, you know, generally. Right. So it's 14 years. I set a goal to have that cleared in seven years by the time I'm 68. All right. And right. We'll see how I go with that. But if I was to say I want to be mortgage free in two years, it feels too big a goal. But if I say I'm going to be mortgage free in seven, halfway between 14, I feel I can achieve that. So take your your goal. Complete financial freedom. What does that look like? You step into it and you put it into bite-sized pieces that you feel you can achieve. And that might be, I'm going to get six figures this year and I'm going to increase and double that next year and I'm going to double it again the year after and I'm going to double it again. Now, when we get that compound, um, we can start to see that growth and that movement. Now it starts to feel much more achievable. So we visualize, yeah, the vision board, great. Right. But you've got to go into the reset, which is the second part of my book. The first part that remember, you have to feel you're in your power. Right. That's where it starts. If I think it's impossible, I'm not in my power. If I feel I'm not good enough or not deserving enough or lucky enough, nothing to do with luck, but all of those things we think we're not in our power. So that first whole third of the book is about helping you to really feel very powerful as a person, as a creator, empowered, I mean, all right, really empowered, like, yes, you know, when you do that Superman pose, that's being proven, um, evidence psychologically that when we stand hand on our hips, head up, I believe in me, that actually our achievements are evidence now psychologically to be far more successful. So that energy of self-belief is absolutely key. So we've got to start there. Then we work into the reset. So I need to look at my beliefs about that. So what we're talking about here is money. My beliefs around money were not good. And that's why money was not showing up in my life. I was born and well, not born, but my mother was poverty conscious. We can't afford this. We can't afford that. We were cold. We were hungry. I had that belief about poverty, that money is something that is golden, that is for other people, that is elusive. So I had to change my thinking and my beliefs. I had to make friends with money. And I literally wrote down 
all a load of mantras about money is my best friend. Money loves me and wants to be in my life and it wants to be in my purse and it wants wants me to spend it so that money is an energy and it needs to flow. Don't lock it down and, you know, we need to... But there's plenty more where that came from and visualising the bank of the universe and I'm a child of God and that's my bank and that's my money and I have access to it. I had to do a lot of work. All right. And I put all of that again into my teachings. There's a lot of it in the book. There's a lot of other stuff. But we have to find those beliefs because so many people, they want the money and they want to be rich. I want to be a millionaire. I want to be a squillionaire. Yeah, great. So do I. So do you. So do most of us. Right. Now, if I ask you, how do you, how, what do you think of rich people? Oh, they're horrible. They're greedy, nasty, bad. you know? <laughs> There. And so, right, okay, well, you ain't going to get money then. If you think that money, uh, that rich people are horrible, then what part of you is aligned with being a rich person? Because your whole energy is going to push that away because rich people are horrible and you don't want to be horrible, so therefore you don't want the money. This is subconscious stuff. So we have to shift that. And the way that I explain it in the book is also we tend to look at the thing that we want rather than the energy underneath it of what it brings us. So let's try this with you. OK, so you want the money for financial freedom. What does that give you? That gives me the power to do whatever I want. Gives you freedom. OK, what does the what does that look like and feel like to do whatever you want? Liberating, exciting, empowering. All of the above. Yes. Yeah. Secure. Yes. And safe. Right. So all the money is attached to freedom, liberation, exciting, empowering. Um, right. So am I those things now? And that's what people don't look at with the Laura chat. They haven't got the money. So I've got a good relationship with money. Let's fix that. Absolutely. Let's fix that. So the money wants to show up. But then we've got to go a little bit deeper and say, so what is money what is what is the thing under money? What's actually bringing me safety, security? So do I feel safe now? Do I feel secure now? Because if I don't, I'm not a match for the money showing up. I'm not vibrating on the same alignment. So that was one of the things with me. I wanted the money because it would make me feel more secure and more safe. And, you know, for somebody who's had PTSD, safety and security is important. So we attach it to the money and we can't attach we can't attack. It doesn't work. We've got to let go. Money isn't going to make me feel safe. I have to make me feel safe. And when I feel truly safe, now I'm a match to money coming because I'm a vibrational match for the safety. Do I feel secure? Yes, I do. I feel really secure in myself, in my business, in my income. Great. So I'm a match there. Right. Um, what else? Money gives you the freedom to pick your own hours, to work smarter, not harder, to say, I want to do less. I want to see my family. I want to take my kids to school. Right. Do I already feel free now or do I feel trapped? OK, so there was a little period, I'll give you an example, for a few months where my elderly mother, who is still going and is still a narcissist, even worse than she was when she was younger. Now she's an elderly, frail narcissist, which is even worse. Um but she started sucking a lot of my time. I need you to do this. I need you to do that. I need I need this. And I need, 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 need over these several months. And my income started to go down. And I was thinking it's because I haven't got as much time available. And, you know, and I looked at it and I thought, no, that's actually not true. Law of attraction is always about the truth. OK, it cannot pull the wool over your eyes. So I was like, is it because... I gave up that Monday or I gave up that Saturday or I took her to the doctors or I did this. No, that's not true either. What is it? I feel trapped. I feel trapped that I have to help my mother, right? So I am not aligned with freedom and money brings me freedom. So the money is being pushed away. So I set a new intention, right? I've got to fix things so that my mother is not making me feel trapped. So I installed a load of help and support around her and I pulled back. I am free. I am free and the money came in and in greater quantities. So we have to look not just at the thing we want, like if we want the car, I want the car. I've got a dream of a particular car. I'd love to have a Jag X type, F type. I'd love that. Right. And then I look at it, what, 65 grand in British money, $100,000, whatever. 
well, that's ridiculous. As soon as we start saying, well, that's ridiculous, we're saying that's not worth that. All right. But that's lack mentality. If I had 10 million, would I spend 60? Absolutely. All right. So it's we have to shift that thinking. So we go, OK, you want the car, whatever the car is right now. Why do you want the car? Because it's luxurious, because it's so comfortable, because it gives me freedom, because what? We go into those. Now, am I a match for those? This is why people miss the bits in the secret. They do the vision board and go, I've been looking at that vision board every day for 30 days and nothing's happened. This stuff doesn't work. The law of attraction is rubbish. It doesn't work. I am on a mission to convince 100 million people that they're wrong, that it does work, that it does exist. Yeah. I was going to say a million people, but I mean, I see three quarters of a million every month. I need I need to, to get this message out more, right? That it does work when you align with it. And people might, I put a video up on my channel the other day saying from zero to 100,000 in four years, let me show you how. And some comments went, 100 grand, well, it's not like you're a millionaire. Who were you to be teaching wealth? I'm like, you haven't seen where I started, mate. Um, and I haven't finished yet, you know, so, you know, I'm on a mission and they tell me, you know, uh, by um, 20, because I'm psychic, you know, by by 2029, I'm going to be absolutely loaded. Financial freedom is what they're telling me. And I'm like, at the moment, I don't really know how that's coming, but the how you have to let the universe figure out. But you have to take responsibility for the action, the action all right, and this is something that people are not getting. They they say, well, I did the action. I created a vision board. Okay, right. If you want financial freedom, what is your part in that? What are you doing as an exchange to get it? Like your show is reaching a lot of people. It's educating people on spirituality and near-death experiences and extraterrestrials. And we need to understand it's not just us in this universe. That's extremely arrogant. There are lots of other lives out there. You are educating, you're sending that message out and you are getting an exchange back. And as your channel grows, then you get more back. And so it goes and so it goes. So you know, what are we actually doing and giving? I want to be of more service to more people. I'm giving my books, I'm giving my time, I'm giving readings, I'm being of more service. But if I want to be truly financially free, I need to think a bit bigger. So I need to step into inspired action. So have I got a plan, right? We need a plan, right? So visualize what we want. Step into the visualization and then say, so how am I going to achieve this? Okay. And we don't have to have all the answers to get to the 10 squillion. Let's start with, can we get to the next bit up and the next bit up? So, you know, when they, um, my team was showing me all these different pieces of the jigsaw, I started putting together different products and courses on my website to help people unlock your block to love, unlock your block to money, unlock your block to health. And they sell and I get a little bit of money from that. And then the book and things like this. But they're giving me more ideas all the time. I had one earlier, another idea. Right, okay, I need to create that. Okay, how to write and publish a book because I know how to do it, right? Can I show you how to do it? How can I help you? We we take the inspired action. So if you're in a job and you want unlimited um, financial freedom and you know in your job there is a ceiling on that money, you know, if you, you're a nurse, you're never going to earn more than, 80, 90 grand. I don't know. I, different different countries, different money. But if, is that financial freedom to you? It's it's not. So in that job, you can't get that from that job. That doesn't mean leave that job. It might mean set up a side hustle, set up a separate business, go into business with somebody else, come up with some other ideas. So we take the action, you know. And when we're aligned with wanting a baby and we're not getting pregnant and it's like, right, we can make that a goal, but then we might need to take inspired action to say, you know, can I look at my diet, my way of eating? Is that impacting? Can I look at my stress levels? Is that impacting? Um, do I need to go down the IVF, uh, IVF um, you know what I mean, uh, route? You know, but I need to take action and not just sit there and say, well, I've been wishing it. That's why my book is called From Hoping to Having, because so many people stay in the hope I'm hoping, I'm staying positive, nothing's happening. It's like, yeah, but you're missing the steps. 
So we've got to look at what we want, but also what's underneath what we want. Like you want the financial freedom. So that X, Y, Z, am I aligned with X, Y, Z? And if I'm not, then how do I fix it? And it's about personal responsibility, but it's also, uh, and that personal responsibility is not blame. It's not the same thing. It's not about blame. It's about saying it might not have been my fault, but it is my responsibility. And also being open to receive. And most of us are not open to receive. It's like you, you just give somebody a compliment. You watch how many times they won't receive that compliment. They bat it back. If you can't receive a simple compliment, you cannot receive from the universe. So we have to learn to ask for help, to be open to receive, to be grateful for that which we receive. All of it is part of it. But I've tried to make my book, and according to the reviews, it's worked, that simple, easy rule book of how life works. And like any game, this game of life, if you know the rules, you can play the game. And if you know the rules really well, you can win the game. And that's the way I see life. It's a game of life. And I want us to win. I want us to win this game of life. So what does that mean? We're not in competition with each other. We're in competition with ourselves. And we need to win. We need to win. And, and what does that look like? It's a life that is fulfilling and enriching and harmonious with amazing connections and love and spontaneity and adventures and curiosity and excitement. And if that's not your story, then you're not winning this game of life. So find a way to understand the rule book. Buy my book, buy somebody else's book. Don't have to be mine. I watched, and lots of people, I watched Jake Ducey. I watched Esther Hicks, Abraham Hicks. I read so many wealth books, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, um, Neville Goddard's on the shelf behind me. I read all these, St. Germain, and I applied. But I found, in all honesty, that... None of them kind of held the whole picture in a way that certainly my brain, and it's probably my brain, that my brain couldn't get it. It got bits of it, but it was like a disjointed picture. But by pulling them all together, it made sense. And that's what I hope to help other people to do, pull it together. Did a little video last week on my channel when I, um, I, I think I headed it like, is tarot lying to me? The law of attraction doesn't work. They say it's coming and it doesn't come. And I did a little video about that because I do tarot on my channel saying, yeah, I can tell you the energy is here. And then you sit there going, right, I'm going to meet the love of my life this month. And it gets the end of the month. Nothing happened. I didn't meet the love of my life. Did you go out? Did you join anything? Did you do anything about it? Uh, no. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and even if you did and it didn't happen, ask yourself these questions. And I post them. I can't remember them all now. But one was... Do I think this is good for me? Do I think if I want money, if I want love, if I want that job, do I think it's good for me? All right. Do I want success? Do I think it's good for me? Because when you really feel into that question, a lot of the times the answer will be no. I don't think this is good for me. I think the money means that I'm going to have to sacrifice time with my family and my friends and I'll never be at home because I'm so successful I'm not available. I don't think it's going to be good for me. All right. That... Yeah, I'm open to love, but do I think it's good for me? Yeah, well, if it goes wrong, it could absolutely wreck my world. So if I don't think it's good for me, I'm going to energetically push it away. So that isn't to give up. It's like as soon as you recognize that, oh, I actually don't think it's good for me. Okay, how do I fix that? Let's fix that. All right, how can I think this is good for me? So if it was something like love, for example, we know that an, a bad love can really break your heart, affect your health, wealth, happiness, job, income. You know, you can lose the plot, all right, for a little while while you're recovering from that broken heart. And then you bounce back eventually. But we've all been there, had the heart broken, and we remember. And so our brain will be kind of like, no, I don't think new love is good for me. I ain't going there again. Yeah. So we have to negotiate with it. And we have to explain. And we have to say... To the old brain, you know, thank you for reminding me. I know you're only trying to protect me, but that was then and this is now. And I've learned ever such a lot since then. I'm older and wiser and more clued up and I'm not going to make the same mistakes again. But I understand your concern, but it's okay, I've got this. And then so we've done the reassurance and then we go into all the good things that it will be. 
right? So think about the partnership, the companionship, the having somebody to come home to, somebody to share my day with, share my troubles with. Think about the joy of um, a cuddle, a hug. Think about the passion. Think about the excitement. Now we're aligning with this is good for me. And now I want it. And now I'll step into it. And now it'll happen. So there were all these little steps and they sound terribly complicated, but they're not. It's about when I say, are you aligned with it? That means, does every single part of you agree with it and want it? And very often what we find is one or two little bits that don't agree with it and don't want it. And then we go, okay, we're going to have to negotiate with you and fix you and then we'll be all right. And then it'll come. Yeah. But we're all a work in progress. So wherever you are on your journey, don't belittle it and don't beat yourself up and don't put yourself down. You're doing the absolute best you can do with the tools that you've got right now in this moment. But work with it and expand it and let it grow and be open to receive and it will come. I promise. Julie, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Should they do that? via comments on your YouTube videos, or is there a way to contact you on your website? You can contact me on my website. It's a contact me form there, but there is only me. I don't have a team. And, uh, you know, having many, many emails come through can be difficult. So um, probably you can, if you really want to do that, you can go to my website, juliepoolonline.com. Um, but you'll find me on my YouTube channel and you can comment on my videos there. And I will be doing some um, lives. Um, I don't do them very often. And um, I will be doing some lives through the summer where I can take questions and answers. I'll probably, you know, they're telling me, yeah, I'll be setting up some live um, law of attraction, your questions answered. And then people can ask me questions live in the comments and I will be answering live on YouTube. That's the easiest way, I think. So keep an eye out for those live shows on Law of Attraction. And I'll, I, I want to help you step into your best life. You know, that's what I call the book. You know, I say, what is it? The ultimate Law of Attraction book. But it's the three R's to create your best life. And um, that's what I want you all to do. And whatever your best life is, don't be in competition with somebody else's best life. Somebody else might say, you know, my best life is to be a squirrely in there with da, 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 da. And your best life might be to have great health, happiness and have a wonderful relationship with your family. And you know what? That's good enough. It doesn't have to be anything more. Just let it be what feels right for you and feels true for you in your own heart. That's what happens. And that's what matters. All right. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want people to know about? At the moment, no. I've got a book in percolating in my head that's going to be a follow on from this. Um, and I've got the title flying around, but it's to do with love and loving life and loving each other um, and finding a way to navigate through all the the mire of uncertainty into love. That will be coming. Um, I haven't started writing it yet, but all my books, the other three on the shelf behind me, I, I, I usually write my books within a month or two. They, they flow. They, they happen very quickly. Um, but for now, I'd be moving into my new home in September. I'm finishing off a whole load of one-to-one -one clients early August. Um, and then, yeah, I will be setting up some events. Um, so keep an eye on my website. You can join my mailing list there if you want to. And when I am doing some events, I will send out a newsletter about it. But for now, thank you for having me and helping me to share the message of love and law of attraction and kindness. Be kind. Just be kind to each other. And more than anything, be kind to you. Well, before we wrap it up, I'm going to ask you for one last positive message. Be the love that you want in the world. Be the source of that which you want to see. Find the love in the smallest, tiniest things and let it build and grow from there. Love yourself. Be proud of yourself. Know that you are truly magnificent. You are a wondrous spark of consciousness inside that human body. And learn to love life a little bit more than you did this morning. And life, I promise you, will love you back. 
Julie, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. You're very welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.